Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Bill Trainer. I'm the Dean of Georgetown Law Center. Uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Georgetown and to the Opioid Litigation Summit. Um, you know, I want to thank uh, I was talking to Professor Maria Glover just before we came on, and uh, this conference is Professor Glover's vision. And uh, she was saying that this is both a, it's a fantastic group of people, uh, much needed program, and that's absolutely right. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd also like to begin uh, by extending my heartfelt thanks to our co-sponsors, the Pew Charitable Trusts and Legislative Analysis and Public Policy Association, LAPPA. So thank you very much for, for your support. Uh, the opioid epidemic is one of the most pressing issues facing our country today. And this conference is the first of its kind. It brings together cross-cutting, diverse, and divergent stakeholders in the opioid crisis and opioid litigation. Attorneys at the forefront of the opioid settlements, bellwethers and bankruptcies, leading complex litigation and bankruptcy scholars, state attorneys general, state and local government officials, leaders on opioids and substance use disorder in the Biden administration, leaders in public health, physicians and substance use disorder treatment professionals, and people in recovery. A conference like this, one that brings together these divergent voices to work together dynamically to maximize funds generated by litigation. A conference like this has never been done before, not for opioids, not for any public health crisis that finds its way to the courts. And this conference was the vision of Georgetown's own Professor Maria Glover, and I am so grateful to her. Uh, Professor Glover is a national expert in complex litigation. She teaches and writes on civil procedure, complex litigation, and the interplay between private litigation and public regulation. Before coming to Georgetown in 2012, she was a Clemenko Fellow and lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. Previously, she clerked for Judge Harvey Wilkinson III, of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, and she practiced in the Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group at Mayor Brown in Washington, DC. So I can't thank Professor Glover enough for her leadership, for her vision, and for developing this conference with Georgetown Law's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and LAPA. I'm honored that Georgetown is hosting this critically important and first of its kind conference. So, Professor Glover, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for um, just getting this conference off to such an important um, and serious start because this issue and, and the issues surrounding it that we're discussing today are so important. And thank you, Bill, so much for your support throughout um, the creation and development of this conference and for Georgetown support in putting on this conference. I want to say a few words before we get started. Um, thank a few people, um, do a little um, introduction to what the conference is going to look like, and to say a little bit about why I, what, what the collision of things in my world that led to this conference. Um, so first of all, um, again, thanks to Bill, um, and, and thanks to all of you panelists and the numerous fantastic participants that we have who will be listening and also participating dynamically with our uh, visioning discussions throughout the conference for being flexible uh, in switching to the remote format. In May and June, we had very much hoped that this would be an in-person conference. I think all of us had a lot of hopes in May and June that many things would look different. And unfortunately, um, the virus has more control than we do. And um, out of reaction to the rise in cases and the Delta variant and the sobering reality that the pandemic of the unvaccinated means the pandemic of our unvaccinatable children. We made the difficult but correct decision, I think, to have this remotely. And there are some people I wanna thank for doing just an unbelievable, a 
above and beyond job at putting together an amazing uh, remote conference. Those people are Max Dreitland, Summer Brown, Sonia Cananser, Melissa Bainey, Kyle Bernardos. We could not have done this without you and thank you so much. Um, just to tell us, tell everyone where we are in this epidemic. So obviously this epidemic has uh, been growing for decades, but it is worse today than ever, compounded alongside and perhaps because of the pandemic. So just days before this summit convened, the CDC released provisional data showing that from February 2020 or, or a little bit before that in 2019, um, in that 12 month period after that, the overdose deaths to February 2021 are up 30% nationwide. In Tennessee, where I'm originally from, South Carolina, West Virginia, Kentucky, 50%. Um, increase in overdose deaths. Vermont, 70% increase in overdose deaths. And overall overdose deaths, according to the CDC provisional data, are the highest recorded since 2015. This is a critical time in the epidemic. But more than that, it's a critical time in the litigation that is attempting to deal with this epidemic. And let me pause on that for a moment. This epidemic found its way to the courts, as do many public health crises. And if you look at the original transcript before Judge Polster, who's the um, multi-district litigation judge presiding over much of this litigation, he comments on the strangeness, perhaps, of an epidemic like the opioid epidemic or other similar public health crises finding their way to the courts. There are countless reasons that are related to features of our regulatory system all the way to other um, problems that we are going to discuss throughout the conference that leads to that situation and just equipped branch to deal with it. But someone had to deal with it. And that is where the attorneys and the uh, state and local government officials and all the various entities who have been working tirelessly on those litigation settlements and bankruptcy have come in to try to come up with solutions that can help fund uh, recovery efforts and can help minimize or at least mitigate some of the um, effects of this epidemic. And in that litigation, we're not just at a critical time at the, in the epidemic, we're at a critical time in the litigation. Settlements are happening, bellwethers are happening and wrapping up, bankruptcies are happening, some are winding down, some are in a little bit of a dispute. So we're at a, the critical time in the epidemic, we're at a critical time in the litigation. And thanks to all of you, we have the critical people in the room. As Bill said, we have attorneys on the front lines of these litigation settlements and bankruptcies. We have leading public health experts, complex litigation scholars, leading bankruptcy scholars, public policy leaders, recovery and treatment professionals, members of the Biden administration, state and local government officials and attorneys general, and we have people in recovery. These are the stakeholders and they're all here. This is a first and it's a critical first in a country in which addressing and regulating so many public health crises often falls to litigation. So thank you to all the magnificent participants who are here for this summit all of whom we'll meet and get to know in more detail as the conference progresses. So this is the time, this is the place, we're in Washington, D.C., or at least Zooming in Washington, D.C., and these are the people. Before we move on, I just want to say a tiny bit about myself, not, not to go on about myself, but how it relates to why I have this vision and what this vision is for this conference. This is a meeting of worlds in my life, and not worlds I necessarily thought would ever meet. I'm a complex litigation expert. I teach, write, and publish about complex litigation. Before I was a professor, I practiced in it. I'm also originally from East Tennessee, which is and has been for some time one of the epicenters of the opioid epidemic. I watched this epidemic build from the ground up firsthand. I was in middle school and high school when Purdue first began marketing long-term use of OxyContin, telling doctors that it was not addictive, and more than that, that any patient asking for higher dose after higher dose after higher dose was not in fact addicted, but just in more pain. They were pseudo addicted. 
And then I watched classmate after classmate after friend after friend get oxy and other similar prescription opioids, sometimes from their parents' medicine cabinets, but more often from their own. A football injury here, a wisdom tooth extraction. In the mid 2000s, I watched classmate after classmate, friend after friend succumb to opioid addiction, addiction that had begun in their teens and early 20s after having been prescribed months worth of oxy for a week's worth of pain. These people were captains of the football team. They were leads in the school plays. They were star students. They were my friends. As the years passed, some of them thankfully found treatment and recovery. Many more of them died. So my worlds collided, my complex litigation world and my, my past in East Tennessee. And I've acted on that collision, not just in complex litigation, but in my work outside of the law center. I do pro bono work with recovery treatment centers in East Tennessee. Again, sort of a colliding of those worlds. And from that collision came a vision. And my vision for this conference and the goals I have for it are intertwined. The vision was to bring together for the first time the diverse cross-cutting and divergent voices in the opioid crisis and opioid litigation in the same room. I have to give room in quotes because we're not in a physical room. And not just that, but to engage these diverse cross-cutting and divergent voices in a series of dynamic and productive discussions. Discussions about how to operationalize public health priorities into settlement reality. Discussions about how to ensure meaningful participation and input by those on the front lines of the crisis, health providers, people in recovery. Discussions about the opportunities and the limitations of litigation, settlement, and bankruptcy to address the opioid epidemic in particular and major public health crises in general. Discussions aimed at bridging divides, divides in language, divides in approach, divides in tools, divides in constraints, divides in priorities among the various stakeholders, all in service of a single united purpose. Tackling this epidemic effectively thoughtfully and comprehensively so that we can save lives, rebuild families and rebuild communities. These broad goals animate our discussions and our work. This is a working conference. As part of this conference, for example, we will be discussing a draft model law for state legislatures to use to help guide spending of settlement funds. These discussions will help us refine this model law, as well as to add context to the possibilities and limitations of such model law. We have an amazing partner in this, LAPA, who I would like uh, to turn over to for a brief moment now to say a few words about this particular project. Um, in particular, I'd like to turn it over to Susan Weinstein. And um, after she tells us a little bit about the model law, I will introduce us to the topics and goals for the day and we will get started. So thank you very much again for being here. Is Susan with us? Susan is, but my video is not working. Can you hear me? Yes, Susan, we can hear you. Okay, for some reason, ah, oh, there I am. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Glover. Um, so uh, I am Susan Weinstein, the president of the Legislative Analysis and Public Policy Association, and or as everybody has been saying, LAPA. And I just wanted to let you know a little bit about LAPA because we've got some heavy hitters here. We've got O'Neill, Georgetown, Pew, and then who's LAPA, you ask? So um, we do a lot of things. We're comprised of a very small organization funded by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And we are comprised of experienced attorneys who do legal research, drafting legislation, et cetera. Um, essentially, what, what, we're, what our part in this is we have the Model Opioid Litigation Proceeds Act, as Professor Glover had said. Um, this was drafted in collaboration with the O'Neill Institute with the nonprofit uh, called the Center for US Policy, which is located here in DC, um, the strategic consulting group um, that's Brown and Weinrob in Albany, New York, and a array of subject matter experts and peer reviewers. And we drafted the Model Opioid Litigation Proceeds Act. And that you all received in, the, in your emails. 
Um, there's been a lot of interest in this issue and we will be listening closely uh, over the next couple of days to incorporate any feedback um, on the law into the finalized model. So this product, I believe, will undoubt undoubtedly benefit the states. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conference and I hope that you all have an informative couple of days and I will turn it over to Professor Glover. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you so much for all the tireless and diligent work that um, you and LAPA have been doing all summer working on uh, putting together this model law. Um, so before we get started, I just want to highlight a couple of things. All of you should have an agenda. If for any reason you don't have um, the agenda materials, please reach out to our uh, fearless uh, leader, Max Streitland, who has all of what you could possibly need. Um, the, the topics, as you can see, are dynamic and, in, and intended to engage diverse voices in um, integrative conversations about various topics related to how to use and how to operationalize settlement funding, design and distribution to address the opioid crisis. Um, but one thing I want to just quickly highlight before we get started is the interactive visioning discussion, which is scheduled from 1 to 2 p.m. And as the email last night stated, that was originally going to be we'd all have lunch in a room and, and do the visioning discussion. So I understand that in a Zoom format, it's like, where's lunch? Well, please feel free to bring lunch in um, to the keynote and the visioning discussion um, where the lunch was originally placed when it was in person. So what is this visioning discussion? It's not just for the panelists who you're going to be hearing from. And of course, if, if you're not a panelist, we're gonna have active Q&A during the panels. But the visioning discussion specifically is designed to bring everybody who's at this conference to the table in service of um, engaging in a couple of very specific questions. Shelly Wiseman um, from the O'Neill Institute here at Georgetown and also one of the, uh, one of the people without whom this conference simply would not happen. She's simply amazing. She and I will facilitate this uh, visioning discussion. Um, and today's visioning discussion, just to give you a, a preview and, and hopefully get you thinking about what we might want to talk about, will focus on two interrelated questions. Um, those questions exist against the backdrop of both the opportunities and the limitations of litigation for public health crises. And um, those questions are two. One, for our advocates, public health experts, people in recovery, what are the critical priorities you would like to share, not just publicly, but specifically with the various legal actors, attorneys, legal scholars, et cetera, who are working to craft the design and to calibrate the distribution of settlements and other funds from these litigations and bankruptcies. And on the flip side, too, for our attorneys, our legal scholars, our state and local legal uh, legal officials, what insights can you provide about how and in some instances whether these critical priorities can best be communicated and potentially integrated and operationalized into the design and distribution of these funds. So that's our visioning uh, discussion. Wanted to give a little bit more detail about that um, as to what it was, who's involved with it, and what precisely we'll be discussing today. So with that, um, my, I don't have uh, anything more in the way of opening remarks. Um, and I will be moderating the first panel, so I'll just start with that. Our first panel, incredible group of people, leading complex litigation experts and attorneys who are at the forefront of these litigation settlements, bellwethers, and bankruptcies. As the agenda says, they're going to give us the state of these settlements, the bellwethers, the settlement design innovations that are going to bring us in sort of to the, the inner world of what's been going on and help set the table for all our discussions to follow. Um, so I'll briefly introduce our panelists and then I will let um, them take the floor. So first we have Professor Elizabeth Chambly Birch. She's the Fuller E. Calloway Chair of Law at the University of Georgia. Uh, her teaching and research includes mass torts, class actions, and civil procedure. Um, she has done extraordinary work on the rights, due process rights, and participation rights of claimants in mass litigation, claimants who are all too often um, forgotten in these mass litigation. So we're thrilled to have her. We have Mark Chalos. He's managing partner at Leif Cabraser, Hyman, and Bernstein in their Nashville office. He's a litigator handling class actions and mass torts and courts across the United States and has had held uh, lead counsel roles in a number um, of cases. 
um, most relevant here, uh, the opioid litigation. So he represents a state, large and small counties, cities, sheriffs, Native American tribes, and health benefit providers in litigation. Um, he's been very involved uh, with multiple aspects of the opioid litigation, and we're thrilled to be hearing from him. We also have Paul Geller, who's also been on the front lines um, of the opioid litigation. He's a managing partner at Robbins Geller Rudman Dowd at LLP in Boca Raton, Florida. He's a founding partner of the firm. Uh, he works a lot in class actions, um, and he's been working on behalf and with government entities and all number of, of mass litigations, and in particular has been working closely on the opioid litigations. We have Georgetown's own Adam Levitin. We're thrilled to have um, another Georgetown representative here. He's the Ann Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown, and his research focuses on bankruptcy and financial regulation, and he's going to be speaking to us about bankruptcy and public Public health crises generally and about bankruptcy and the opioid litigation and his experience with that in particular. And finally, we have Professor Sergio Campos from the University of Miami Law. Um, he's an expert in compl uh, complex litigation, oh, civil procedure. Is someone no, asking? not here? Hello? Oh, I'm not sure if someone was, was trying to ask a question. Um, so uh, Professor Campos is from the University of Miami. He um, is an expert in complex litigation, civil procedure, um, and, and especially regulation and how litigation and complex litigation fits within an overall regulatory scheme, both um, here and abroad. And he's going to do a lot of situating for us as to how crises like the opioid crisis end up in litigation and how that works as a regulatory matter. So I could say a um, hundred million more things about how wonderful these people are, but I don't want to take any more time from them. So um, I just like to start um, with the panel. They're gonna say a few words um, starting with Professor Campos, introducing us a little bit to the opioid litigation and its broader role in the regulatory system. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Campos. Maria, thank you so much. And I want to thank all of the organizers for putting together this wonderful and essential summit talking about how different, uh, different actors can help to address the opioid crisis. Uh, I, as I understand that uh, this audience is summit includes a lot of non-litigators and non-lawyers who may be puzzled that uh, such a health crisis is being addressed through private litigation or quasi-private public litigation involving you know, cities, counties, and, and state attorney generals. And so what I'd like to do to start off the panel is to provide a little bit of uh, sort of a view from the force as to the role litigation plays and the uh, sort of the regulatory ecosystem of the United States, um, it, it sort of from a thousand foot level um, to help situate everyone and sort of try to make some sense of how we got here in the first place. So I'm going to uh, share a presentation. So what I wanna do is just basically make three points um, involving the functions of litigation in US law and then talk a little bit about some of the uh, special features that arise when you have this type of uh, situation where you have multiple claimants against one or a few defendants, what we call aggregate litigation in US law, and then talk a little bit about some of the very special considerations that are raised by this particular litigation in the opioid context. So um, to really understand the role of litigation in the US law, you may, you, uh, particularly uh, non-lawyers, you're probably familiar with the, uh, with, with the common um, adage that the United States is a particularly litigious society. And what I would argue is that that's actually a feature, not a bug. So imagine, for example, that you want to regulate the conduct of a defendant or a potential defendant. And so I'm moving the cursor over here. The delta typically represents defendant uh, when, when, when people talk in the litigation context. And so Typically, when people think of regulate or think of controlling the behavior of potential defendants, they think of direct regulation, direct control over the decision. Um, but what we like to do here in the United States is use liability as a form of indirect control over the decision through hindsight. The idea being, um, and if you're a parent, this should be particularly familiar to you. If you want to control the behavior, of, for example, your child, 
One way that you could do so is be a helicopter parent. You can sort of follow your child around, make sure that they don't get into trouble and then prevent any sort of bad conduct from happening. I myself am a helicopter parent. Um, and this is a sort of can be used as a rough analogy for uh, just direct regulation. But my parents um, were more of the liability, uh, focusing less on hovering over us, but instead using sanctions in the form of punishments to, to, to sort of make sure that we stayed in line. Um, and, and there's something very effective about using something like a punishment like liability or the threat of litigation or the threat of having to pay damages because um, what, uh, you know, helicopter parenting in the form of direct regulation is often very information uh, intensive and, and, and time consuming. But the beauty of using something like liability is that it induces defendants, potential defendants to use their own information to make a choice. The theory is that if you set the sanction at the appropriate level and impose it effectively as a credible threat, potential defendants will see that sanction and will adjust their conduct accordingly. And they will use their own private information to make socially appropriate choices. And so in the United States, we rely heavily on litigation in the form of contract liability, tort liability, consumer protection, securities fraud, antitrust. We rely on private attorneys bringing lawsuits for damages as an effective threat to induce potential defendants from not committing uh, unlawful acts in the first place. It's a, it's a very uniquely American way of addressing social behavior and social problems. So with that sort of background in mind, aggregate litigation adds sort of a more complicated wrinkle to this. So I created a little timeline, you saw a version of it, where you can imagine um, the potential defendant makes a choice between doing an unlawful act, we'll call it X, or not doing the unlawful act. This causes harm to, let's say, a, a plaintiff, we'll call it plaintiff one. This harm can has a certain kind of amount or extent, we'll call this the loss, we'll call this L1. And after this is caused and after there, there's an amount of damages suffered, then we have a lawsuit. So that's a typical normal one-on-one -on -one lawsuit. Now, in some, because of a proliferation of industrialization and mass production, you have situations where a decision, a single decision, a single policy affects not just one person, but a whole host of people, cast of thousands. Each of those people all suffer their own individual harms, their individual losses, their individual damages. And in theory, each of these individuals would bring their own, uh, their own lawsuits. So when you have a situation where you have many people affected by a single decision, then you run into some problems with respect to the workings of this type of sanction-based uh, ex post liability system of regulation. But the one thing I really wanna stress here, um, this is true here of the opioid litigation, this is true of a lot of complex litigation situations, is that despite the many, and despite the uniqueness of some of the damages that they suffer, the, the uniqueness of some of the losses that they suffer, um, it's usually all tied to a single decision that was made by the defendant ex ante. So they all share, all these, all these uh, victims, all of these plaintiffs in the litigation, in order to prove their claims in the litigation would have to prove certain common facts that arise from this, from this common or same decision that affects all of them equally. And so the problem when you have this situation where many people all suffer from a, a single decision um, by a single defendant, such as for example, um, the manufacturers here like Purdue and their decisions with respect to uh, the marketing of, of opioids, right? Th those decisions were made, um, each of the individuals here were affected by the same types of decisions that were made, um, is that um, you have this problem that can be sort of called asymmetric stakes. So you're seeing a lot of symbols here. Uh, some people are more comfortable with math than others. I, I tend to like math because it tends to clarify things. These are simple sort of payoff um, equations with respect to the incentives of defendants and plaintiffs in litigation. So for example, for the defendant, um, not only do are they worried about their liability, we'll, we'll call this L, um, there is, it, it's uncertain because they could win or they could lose. 
plus there's costs associated. They, they hire their attorneys, they hire experts uh, um, in order to litigate the case. Same with the plaintiff. But the problem is that the stakes are different, focusing here on what's at stake. So for the defendant, uh, any, any sort of issue with respect to, for example, fraudulent marketing of opioids is not only going to be, uh, it's not only going to uh, affect uh, one case brought by a single plaintiff, but any other case brought by any potential plaintiffs, the, the, the whole class of people that are affected by that single decision, right? Uh, that's going to, you know, anything that's sort of invested, any sort of common evidence that's developed is going to be not only useful for a, a case brought by a single plaintiff, but for future cases as well. So the stakes are actually quite large for a defendant, whereas for an individual victim bringing a lawsuit, the stakes are much, much smaller. And so that's the key thing I want to show here with aggregate litigation, is that from a single victim's perspective, they're only going to care about investing in their own case only with respect to their payoff. And their payoff could be substantial, but it's always gonna be dwarfed by the total amount of liability that the defendant is facing, which means that defendants are going to invest a lot more in the litigation because they simply have more at stake. So a lot of techniques in aggregate litigation are really designed to uh, mitigate this particular uh, problem with asymmetric stakes. So how do you do it? What you basically do is you assign control over the claims in the litigation to a single person. Here I'll use the example of multi-district litigation. One of the most effective tools, uh, one of the most effective things that multi-district litigation does is essentially assign effective control to a lead counsel um, that uh, will invest in common issues and do so um, because they have a, a payoff of winning a percentage of the total recovery. When, because um, they are investing with respect to some percentage of the total recovery, not just the amount of recovery for an individual victim, they'll have similar incentives to invest as the defendants. And so you have a situation now where in terms of investing in these common issues, the extent of the fraudulent marketing of the, of the manufacturer, the opioids like Johnson & Johnson, um, uh, Purdue, uh, they, the, the defendants obviously have a ton at stake because there's many, many people that are going to rely on the same type of, of, of issues with respect to fraudulent marketing. Now the lead counsel who's uh, investing with, a, with the ability to get a percentage of the total amount is now, now has pretty similar stakes. And this evens out the, the stakes, it evens out the incentives, and then you have essentially a level playing field. So all sort of aggregate litigation procedures, class actions, multi-district litigation, they all have this kind of feature in order to make sure that both sides have the same amount of stakes so that um, both sides will invest sufficient amounts or equal amounts so that it's not sort of David versus Goliath all the time. And then, so what do you do about situations where, you know, each of the victims have their own individual types of losses, everyone is unique, everyone is uniquely affected by something like the opioid crisis, then typically what, can, what you can do in a litigation is you can have investment in common issues related to the, the common course of conduct, maybe you might even have a trial with respect to certain issues, um, and then you can just Re, you can then just uh, disaggregate and have the individual victims bring their lawsuits where they can focus on their more idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic issues, such as the amount of damages that they suffered. Um, you can do this in a number of ways. Um, the key here is not so much whether there's actually a single trial. The, the, the key really is that they have the same investment incentives. And so, you know, multi-district litigation, when common response is uh, make sure that you have everyone sort of organized, you assign lead counsel, you have a uh, discovery, and in the discovery process, both sides, both the defendant and lead counsel have sufficiently similar investment incentives to develop the facts and the legal arguments in the case. And then you can just sort of proceed by having what's known as bellwether trials, just have individual cases. Um, you don't even have to have a liability case, just bring individual suits, 
But the beauty is that because we've already had common investment in these issues, each of these individual uh, plaintiffs will benefit from the work that's done by the lead counsel. Now, with, with that background in mind, there's even more idiosyncratic special considerations that are raised by this particular type of litigation. Probably the, the, the most remarkable upon is the fact that typically in litigation, it's usually brought by the victims themselves in a private capacity. But here in, in this litigation, we have a significant, um, uh, 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 significant involvement by uh, cities, counties, uh, state MDLs, um, uh, 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 sovereign, uh, sovereign tribes, as well as other types of governmental authorities. But what's interesting is that um, they're not sort of regulating, they're, they're speaking on behalf of the victims. Um, and because we have sort of subunits within subunits, you sort of have a situation where there could be some difficulties with respect to coordinating um, some of this litigation. And so as I borrowed this beam from a, a, an opioid litigation settlement tracker, um, on top of this, you also have different forums with respect to bringing the litigation. And so on top of, for example, the MDLs, which involves the cities and counties, you, uh, or involves some, um, you have the MDLs, you also have state attorney general actions that are brought um, in state courts. You also have bankruptcy proceedings with respect to some of the key defendants. Um, and, it's, and then there's a real tricky issue as to how to coordinate each of these different uh, litigations. My understanding is that the judge and it's assigned to the, the, the federal MDL, Judge Polster in, in, in Ohio has worked really hard to try to make sure there's coordination among the different types of proceedings that are happening here. Um, and then, uh, and I think this is, this is particularly a, a, a very sensitive concern with respect to opioids is that um, typically in litigation, you have an injury and it's pretty discreet, it happens, you can sort of assess the loss in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, lost wages, um, hospital bills. Uh, but in this case, um, the nature of, of, of the opioid crisis is that it leads to this sort of continuous long-term addiction. And so um, how you remedy that in the remedial phase, because this money is being collected, um, makes it raises some pretty tricky issues, which I which I'm sure are going to be discussed here in the context of, of, of this summit. Um, what, one last thing I want to note here is that um, the way litigation works in the United States, the the money that's being won in these lawsuits are really doing sort of a, a double duty. They're both a sanction to try to deter potential defendants from engaging in this type of unlawful conduct in the first place. At the same time, they also have this really important compensatory function where you are actually trying to remedy a harm that's caused by the unlawful conduct of actual defendants. And so here we wanna make sure that not only the defendants pay for the, for the damage that they cause, but we also wanna make sure that the money that's collected is used in an efficient way to help those victims um, who, who, who suffered from this unlawful conduct. Hopefully this provides some context for why, how we ended up here and some of the theory of why we do things that we do here. Uh, and I hope you find it helpful. And I look forward to what the other panelists have to say with respect to other key features of this litigation. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, and, and, and kudos to you for trying to teach an entire semester of civil procedure and complex litigation in such a short time and for, for bringing all of this um, home to the opioid litigation. And the very last thing you said uh, cues up our next panelist. You talked about the, the ultimate victims of, of these sorts of public health epidemics, and in this case, the opioid epidemic. And that takes us directly to Professor uh, Elizabeth Chambly Birch, who's going to speak um, in particular about the, the victims of the opioid epidemic and the victims in complex litigation more generally and how claimants can uh, sometimes be sort of left out of the process and how in her work and the work of others, we're trying to bring claimants more into the process. So Beth. Thank you, Maria. Thanks so much for having me. Um, 
So I actually want to give you kind of a 30,000 foot view rather than getting right into the weeds. I know that we have a really diverse audience. And uh, for many of you, I suspect this is probably the first time you've ever heard of multi-district litigation or MDL as we tend to call it. Um, so I thought I'd start by talking about what makes MDL exceptional, um, why it's a little bit different than everything else uh, we deal with normally in litigation. So when you coordinate cases under MDL, it doesn't require a high degree of commonality. Uh, you just have to have one or more common questions of fact, which means that common questions don't have to be super important. They don't have to predominate over individual ones. Um, that makes MDL useful in many ways because it can host a variety of loosely related cases. But it also means that parties' aims and desires might align on some matters and then differ on others. Um, that raises questions down the line about settlement allocation and about adequate representation. Um, it's a little different than class actions, although certainly there can be attempts to certify a class action within an MDL. Um, but unlike class actions, there's no ability to opt out of the MDL. Uh, both the plaintiffs and the defendants can effectively be dragged across the United States to a forum that would ordinarily lack personal jurisdiction over them. So once they get into this forum, uh, the judges here, Judge Polster, uh, appoint lead lawyers. These are typically insiders. Um, most plaintiffs find themselves being represented by lawyers that they've never met who are chosen for their expertise in practical administration and in settlement. Um, in reality, then, there can be conflicts of interest among the MDL plaintiffs themselves. Different folks want different things out of a proceeding, um, and even sometimes between the MDL plaintiffs and the lead attorneys. So how, then, as a general matter, is, is MDL constitutional? Uh, the MDL judge, in this case, Judge Polster, doesn't have nationwide jurisdiction to try all of these cases, which is why you'll notice that the bellwether cases that he's hearing tend to be from Ohio, including the pharmacy cases that are slated to start in early October. Um, so what makes the MDL court's exercise uh, of power constitutional is this idea that the original court does have jurisdiction and frankly the complete fiction that these cases are only being transferred for pretrial purposes temporarily. Uh, the idea, of course, in theory, being that at some point these are going to actually return back home for trial. Um, in reality, less than 1% of all the cases that are transferred through MDL ever return home uh, for trial. So as you might imagine, this can raise federalism concerns that run roughshod over nuances and different state laws. Um, the idea behind MDL is that MDLs are supposed to fill, fill gaps that are caused by jurisdictional boundaries among different states and by the differences across uh, governing state laws that make it really difficult to certify some of these cases as class actions. But once they're centralized, these MDLs become kind of highly nationalist animals. Uh, so in the pursuit of settlement, uh, MDLs tend to take a lot of liberties when it comes to hard and fast jurisdictional lines and choice of law rules. Uh, one federal judge has described MDL as a, quote, mushing of 50 states' laws together. Um, so the existence of parallel cases can cause tension too uh, when these cases are bubbling up through state courts, particularly when it comes to uh, common benefit attorneys fees and the MDLs. I'll give you one example from a state court uh, judge who was handling kind of the state equivalent of an MDL. Um, the judge said, if I get the case first, I hit the ground running to get out in front of the MDL. We want to cooperate and coordinate, but we don't want to cooperate and coordinate ourselves out of the system. So this push to resolve cases, plus uh, the stigma that remanding cases is a failure for the MDL judge, can lead to really heavy handed and highly creative case management with a lot of MDL judges adopting kind of a cowboy on the frontier mentality that has become an accepted norm. In any other context, we would expect all those wrinkles and kind of those, uh, those tensions that arise from that sort of mentality to be smoothed out through the appellate process. Um, but because MDL focuses on pretrial matters and most cases end in settlement, um, historically, very few MDL issues have reached the appellate courts. So then when you come to opiates, um, we tend to think of opiates, or at least I do, as kind of the ordinary, extraordinary MDL uh, on steroids uh, because it has become so complex. So the opiate litigation exposes in the raw all of the things that these MDL insiders uh, have known. It asks us what we really expect courts to do when they are called, in the words of Judge Polster, to serve. It challenges all the orthodoxies that I've described across every different dimension. 
Um, it includes, uh, last time I counted, which has been a while ago, it included over 2,800 cases against a slew of dif disparate defendants. We've got manufacturers like Johnson & Johnson, distributors like McKesson, pharmacy retailers like CVS and Walgreens. And so the MDL, as I know uh, probably all of you know, as, uh, consists of the localities bringing the cases, the cities and the counties, which is a big departure from the states themselves. And we'll of course talk about some of the stinging memories of tobacco, which uh, are driving these opiate cases forward. Um, so when he initially received the MDL, Judge Polster largely agreed to empower the consensus slate that the plaintiff's lawyers put forward uh, early in the process. Uh, back then, there were only 200 cases in the proceeding. Um, when he later selected uh, class counsel for the negotiation class, um, Judge Polster ended up picking only two of the seven lawyer negotiation team because he felt like five of the attorneys uh, that were on the steering committee that also represented the states were conflicted. Uh, in his words, they presented a conflict of interest that barred them from representing and negotiating on behalf of the class. But when the negotiation class later failed, the status quo returned, uh, meaning that some of the same conflicted lawyers, in his words, uh, could continue to negotiate on behalf of the MDL plaintiffs, and that the constitutional standard was somehow lower uh, for the MDL than it is in a class. So we then have 500 plus state court cases, uh, including 49 cases by state attorney generals. Um, and then we have, I think, maybe the major sticking point, which is the 30,000 some odd localities that haven't yet sued, but could. Uh, and that's, of course, the concern, I think, from the defense perspective, with the worry being that if we negotiate a settlement, then you'll have all of these folks that come out of the woodwork and decide to sue. So um, as as Professor Glover has been um, talking about, Judge Polster was very frank from the very beginning that he didn't want trials. Uh, instead, he wanted a quick settlement because he felt like the legislatures had punted a public health crisis into his lap and, of course, into the laps of the courts. So what emerged then were these sort of two competing centers, um, the AGs versus the MDL. Uh, which created preclusion challenges. It made defendants reluctant to settle given their desire for global peace. And it sets up a really unusual federalism dynamic with the state attorney generals racing to the courthouse, resisting attempts to empower localities as the negotiators, um, and frankly, pushing information out to the public um, like Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy did when she disclosed all the details about the Sackler family that had remained uh, secret within the MDL. So in addition to what we think of as kind of ordinary MDL inventions like loan pine orders and direct filing orders, um, we have a, a lot more procedural innovation when it comes to the opiate MDL, including the, the negotiation class, which I mentioned earlier as an, an attempt by um, Special Master, then Special Master Francis McGovern, along with Bill Rubenstein to try to loop in uh, those 30,000 different localities that hadn't sued, it was ultimately decertified by the Sixth Circuit. Um, we're also seeing an extraordinary use of mandamus to try to throw out bellwether trials on state preemption grounds, to try to prohibit late amendments. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the mandamus positions, petitions were what ultimately unearthed some of the ARCOS data. So what we're seeing now is bankruptcy again, emerging as the centralizer anew. Uh, we've gotten a lot of details coming out with the Purdue Pharma settlement. Uh, I know that folks later in this uh, panel are gonna talk a little bit about that. But I guess where I'll end is just kind of with a question about our values and whether our values have gotten a little out of whack. Um, it, it raises some big open questions, certainly with regard to the end victims of, of opiates. Um, questions about what it means to do justice in these kind of mega cases that are dumped into the laps of the courts. Um, to what extent can cities and counties without their own attorney on the leadership team just sort of sit back and trust the process to work for them? Um, and how can we give better effect to the individual and state rights on which procedure is based while still allowing MDL to, to fill all of these important gaps? So I'll end with that. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, that just provides such a great overview, not just of how all these litigations got going, but also um, forecasts this negotiation class issue, which was um, an innovation designed by the late Francis McGovern and Bill Rubenstein at Harvard that 
um, potentially would have resulted in settlements um, and resolution um, and more robust negotiation had it not been uh, decertified by the Sixth Circuit and more functionally for purposes of our next speaker, it might have prevented some of this, not all of it, but some of it from going to bankruptcy. We're gonna talk about bankruptcy in addition to litigation throughout this panel, um, but first we're going to turn to Professor Adam Levitin for the groundwork. How does bankruptcy function alongside and on top of litigation in these sorts of mass crises? Um, how it ties in the opioid litigation to the negotiation class issue? Um, and where things are with that. So Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Um, so bankruptcy is sort of the streets and sanitation of the US economy. It's the residual policy form where everything ends up if Congress doesn't set up sort of the equivalent of a special recycling or composting program. Think of the Black Lung, lung Fund. And uh, if, if Congress doesn't take special action, problems where you have mass liability, whether it's from a pu public health issues or otherwise, end up being resolved in the bankruptcy system. And the problem is that the bankruptcy system is not designed to deal with a public health crisis. And it's not designed to deal with issues of moral culpability, um, which is you know, particularly an issue for Purdue. Um, Instead, it's a system that's designed to facilitate deals to distribute a limited fund among claimants. And in bankruptcy, everything is going to be monetized. It's going to be boiled down to dollars and cents, no matter how, how you were harmed. And um, that's not a moral process. It's kind of an amoral process, as it were. And that's fine when you're dealing with an over-indebted retailer or a lawn care company. But it's a really bad fit when you're dealing with a thorny public policy issue. And it's a particularly bad problem because bankruptcy is a system that resolves problems on a firm by firm basis. It is not, there's no process for having an industry wide global resolution in bankruptcy. It's firm by firm, so you can get disparate outcomes between bankruptcies. Now, bankruptcy is a process that works very differently than regular litigation. It's not a process that is familiar to most people, and it's often kind of an inside baseball culture. So here's my, I'm going to attempt to explain it in, I don't know, three plus minutes. Um, and so bear with me, please. Um, the idea is that, uh, again, is that bankruptcy is going to be trying to deal with the problem of a limited fund. And the basic idea is that bankruptcy is going to provide a single forum that will take control of all the debtor's assets and address all of the claims against the debtor, opioid and otherwise. And this is all going to happen in a single forum. So when uh, the debtor files for bankruptcy, and bankruptcies are almost always voluntary events, the, uh, there's actually a new legal entity that gets created. It's called a bankruptcy estate. The bankruptcy estate has control of all of the debtor's assets, no matter where they're located. For the most part in the US system, the bankruptcy estate is going to be controlled by the debtor, sort of the pre-bankruptcy management, even though there is a possibility of an independent trustee. And related debtors are uh, parent companies and subsidiaries, each have to file separately, but they'll have their cases jointly administered with, there'll be a single judge, single docket for all of it. All of the claims that exist against the debtor are going to get channeled into the bankruptcy court because bankruptcy will automatically stay any attempts to collect from the, from the debtor outside of the bankruptcy court. And the only way you can collect is through the bankruptcy court. And the way you try and collect is you file a claim against the debtor. So you're not starting a lawsuit. You're, it's a ministerial process. You submit a short form uh, to the court, uh, to a, not even to the court, but to a claims agent. And um, in bankruptcy, it's not just going to be the opioid claims that are coming in. It's everything. So it's all the other tort creditors, you know, pelvic mesh, for example. It may, uh, it can be government creditors like Medicare seeking reimbursements for with with Acthar gel. It can be tax authorities. It can be intellectual property. If you know, with you know, where there's a dispute about who owns a patent or something for um, a drug manufacturer, it's bondholders. It's employees. 
And it doesn't matter if the debtor is current on those obligations or not. In bankruptcy, all future debts get telescoped to present. Now, if creditors don't file claims, the debtor can also file the claims for, the, for them. That's called scheduling a claim. That's the bankruptcy speak. And what this means is that debtors can file claims also for future claimants, not just the present ones. So bankruptcy law deems claims to be allowed they, uh, unless they're contested. This is, again, very different than regular litigation. But allowed does not mean that you're getting paid anything. It just means that you are eligible to get a payment. Right there, it can be allowed and the payment might be nothing. So a really important thing about bankruptcy is that the debtor gets to choose where to file. Right? And there's tremendous flexibility about filing venue. Basically, a well-counseled debtor can pretty much choose to file anywhere it wants in the United States. Um, creditors do not have to have any contacts whatsoever with the bankruptcy form. It's not even a minimum context thing. How this is constitutional has never been clear to me, but uh, no court has ever taken this issue up. Um, because debtors can choose where they file, what they're going to naturally do is they're going to pick a court that they think is going to be favorable to them. And debtors have gotten very good at manipulating local rules um, so that they're not just picking their court, but they can actually select the individual judge. Um, so Purdue handpicks a judge in White Plains, New York, for example. Um, Mallinckrodt makes a different decision, goes to Delaware, where in Delaware you can't really pick your judge, but you know what you're getting. There's kind of a Delaware brand that you know you're getting if you file in Delaware. Um, and one of the real problems that exists in the bankruptcy system is that some courts are competing for, for large cases. There are 375 bankruptcy judges in the US, and most of them are not in competition. But there are a few districts or kind of judicial divisions within districts that are. There's Delaware, there's White Plains, there's Richmond, and there's Houston. And to give you a sense of just how extreme this is, last year, 55% of large public company bankruptcy cases ended up before just three of the 375 judges we have nationwide. Um, now, I don't want to beat this horse too much. This is my one of my pet issues, but it's, uh, it'll, it's more of a Purdue problem than... than um, opioids generally. But the way the courts attract business is with the implicit promise that they will give the debtor the rulings it wants on all the major issues in the case. And if they don't, if they disappoint, if the courts disappoint, what happens? The business goes elsewhere. And everyone knows this is how the game is played. And it means the debtor might lose on small issues around the edges. But the you know, once the debtor is able to kind of present a deal to the court, that deal's going through. Okay, so what is, what is this about the deal? The goal of the bankruptcy process is going to be the court's confirmation of a plan of reorganization. The plan is not created by the court. The court just says up or down on the plan. Maybe actually the court will sometimes blue pencil a little bit on the, uh, around on the edges, but it's not the court's plan. Instead, the plan, the plan is proposed generally by the debtor, but it's usually the process of negotiations with creditors and will have support from at least some creditor groups. The plan's gonna set forth what's going to happen with all the claims, how they're gonna be treated, and what's gonna happen with the debtor's business going forward. And the plan has to be confirmed uh, after a disclosure process and a creditor vote. So the disclosure process means that the court has to approve a document called a disclosure statement that has to contain adequate information for creditors, you know, to, so that they're going to have, there's, we want there to be an informed vote. And that uh, the disclosure statement is going to say who pays, how the pot's divided, um, and that so creditors are going to get grouped into different classes, and there's going to be different payments for different classes. And if there are any injunctive provisions, that will be in there as well. Creditors are then going to be going to vote on the plan. So they're going to, they're going to, be, they're going to get notice, there's going to be a vote. And the vote is rather complicated um, that the creditors vote by classes and each class has to approve a plan by both one half of the number of creditors and two thirds of the dollar amount. Um, or there's an alternative method where you just need a single class but then there are additional substantive requirements. Once all this is done, the court will have a confirmation hearing and the court has to find that there's a bunch of statutory requirements that have to be met. But here's the key thing. 
the court is not deciding about whether the plan is a good idea or whether it's the best plan. It's just, there's a laundry list of, the, the, of findings the court has to make. And if those are met, the court has to approve the plan. So the key things on that checklist are the plan has to be proposed in good faith. And everyone has to get at least as much as they would in a hypothetical liquidation of the debtor. But often that means, you know, you don't have to get much of anything. And the plan has to be feasible. So in other words, the debtor's not gonna end up back in bankruptcy. There's nothing else about the merits of the plan. And because there's this liquidation baseline, it means that the existing equity holders, the shareholders of the, of the company are likely to lose everything. They're gonna get wiped out. So if this company is reorganizing, it's gonna have, there's gonna, the equity of the reorganized company is going to be given to someone else. And that might be, it might be distributed to one or more classes. So Mallinckrodt is giving the equity to a bunch of bondholders, but um, Purdue, essentially the equity is going to a bunch of tort victim classes. It's not going directly, it's going through some trusts, but effectively they're getting the, the, the equity interest. So if all, these, if all the elements on the checklist are met, court will confirm the plan. And this is the really key thing about bankruptcy. When a bankruptcy plan is confirmed, it will bind all creditors, even if they objected. This is very different than a class action settlement. If you have a, a, a 23B3 class action settlement, there's always the ability to opt out. If it's the, your monetary damages class, you can say, hey, I don't like the deal. I'll take my chances on my own. You can't do that with bankruptcy. A bankruptcy plan will bind non-consenting creditors. So let's notice what's missing here, because this is, I think, often kind of the story of the, the kind of the, the dog that didn't bark. There's no trial here on the merits. Right. You're not going. If you're an opioid creditor, you're not going to get your day in court in bankruptcy. You can have your day in court to object to details of the bankruptcy plan, but your case will not get tried on its merits. It's possible to have bellwethers because the court does need to come up with some kind of. There needs to be some sort of an, an estimate of what the, the opioid claims are worth, but the. Um, the court is just estimating for voting bankruptcy purposes, for voting and plan feasibility purposes. It's not estimate, it's not deciding how much any individual personal injury claimant is owed, for example. And this means that distribution to creditors is going to go forth according to whatever's in the plan. And typically that's going to set up an administrative process. Usually that's, you know, you submit a claim to some administrative claims agent. And if uh, you get paid based on how your, your claim, um, qualifies under a schedule. So you, you claim you, know, you were, that you had opioid addiction, you get this much, that, there, that you had an overdose, you get this much extra, that you know, your loved one died, you get this much extra. Um, sometimes this kind of system will allow uh, for parties that don't like the, the kind of the, the, schedule, the, the basic schedule to litigate on their own. Um, but they're not going to be able to bring this as a class. It would be just you're out there individually. So what's going on here? Bankruptcy is first and foremost about cutting deals. It's a it's a pro, the, the whole structure of the bankruptcy process is designed to facilitate deal making. Deals are often going to be cut through a mediation process, organized into committees that represent their their groups. And then once a deal gets cut, it becomes a snowball, and anyone and it's just kind of rolling down the hill and parties that are in opposition either get on board or get flattened and courts are unlikely to stand in the way of the deal. So what does this mean uh, in the end about uh, once in a while we have cases like we have situations like with Purdue where you have non-debtors that are, that are an issue. So one of the key issues in Purdue is the, um, whether the Sacklers who own, uh, own Purdue can get releases without themselves filing for bankruptcy. So the Purdue plan has the Sacklers chipping in uh, four and a half billion over 10 years in exchange for getting basically a global release from, uh, from all opioid claims against them. Um, bankruptcy does not, have, it's, bankruptcy law is a little unclear on, where, on whether you can do this. There's a split among circuits about whether it's possible to have any kind of a non-debtor release in bankruptcy. And of course, debtors are, that are concerned about this will file in courts that 
say yes, yeah, you can you can do non-debtor releases. Um, certainly, when the debtor itself has claims against the third party, so Purdue has various fraudulent transfer claims against the Sacklers, that's that's very you know that can certainly be released. The debtor can settle its own its own claims. But whether creditors' claims against third parties can be released, that um, that's again going to be court dependent. And that's in Purdue right now, that issue is being appealed and uh, we'll see. But even when courts allow this, they want to see a very high um, percentage. There's no specific threshold, but a very high percentage of creditor support for such releases. Um, I think kind of as a rule of thumb, if you don't see 90% of personal injury uh, claims voting in favor of, of, the, of a plan that has releases, the court is unlikely to approve those. Um, but that's only if parties that vote. If you don't vote, you don't count. And in Purdue, you know, it's only a very small fraction of people who really have claims against Purdue who ever actually voted. So we have kind of a, a voter turnout issue, as it were. Um, I guess kind of wrapping up here, big point. Bankruptcy is potentially appealing to companies with opioid liabilities because it gives them a tool that they otherwise lack, namely the ability to bind non-consenting parties, including future claims to, to a deal. It's also potentially appealing to some uh, governmental units because in bankruptcy allows payments to be structured. You can do, have a, any kind of, basically all the creativity you want in payment structuring, but allows payments to be structured such that, the, uh, that payments do not necessarily have to go into a state general fund. And if money is, if money goes into the state general fund, it's going to be used for filling you know, for filling potholes and Lord knows what else. It, it's not your mark for opioid abatement. Bankruptcy enables a process where you, where funds can be earmarked for opioid abatement, and that that's something that makes the process potentially appealing to um, state and municipal governments. Um, the problem if you're a personal injury victim is you're not the only ones at the table in a bankruptcy. It's, it's all the other creditors, and that includes everyone else in the opioid universe, right? So in Purdue, you have all kinds of phar pharmacies and, and distributors that have their own claims against Purdue. They're getting a piece of the pie along with the, 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 the personal injury victims and the governmental units. Um, so that's that's the downside if you are you know if you're an act, uh, sort of a direct uh, tort creditor or even governmental unit, and it's a process that uh, I think and I think maybe the biggest takeaway is it's a process that's going to avoid trials, and that creates more flexibility for deals. But you know the deals that are not going to make everyone happy, and um, that's kind of the nature of bankruptcy. It doesn't usually leave people real happy in the end, but. Um, it's trying to make the best of a bad situation. Thank you so much, Adam. So just to very, very briefly sum up before we transition, we've heard from Professor Campus about kind of how aggregate litigation and complex litigation works generally and, and works sort of as a regulatory matter. Um, Beth brought us up to speed with a lot of the litigations and um, the settlements, as well as some of the stakeholders, including um, victims of the opioid crisis. And then Adam laid on top of this, um, the, the interesting role of bankruptcy, um, which is connected with complex litigation, not just because sometimes it comes in when complex litigation doesn't work and sort of as a backstory, in part because there used to be a way under the class action rule um, to do something that looked a little bit like bankruptcy under a limited fund class action, but Supreme Court jurisprudence all but sent whatever would have gone there into bankruptcy. And there are pros and cons to that. And there are interesting questions and important questions about how bankruptcy and the litigation um, can and should interact to ensure compensation, deterrence, and as Adam pointed out, direction of funds um, towards addressing the opioid epidemic instead of you know patching potholes. That's sort of the broad overview of our complex litigation, our settlements of litigation, of bankruptcy. Now we're going to hear um, from two attorneys who have been working on the front lines of this and can take these broader points and illustrate how they've been working and um, proceeding within 
um, the actual litigations and the actual bankruptcies and opioids. First, we're going to hear from Paul Geller, who's going to provide an overview of his work on this litigation, a little bit how about how it got before Judge Polster, but quickly kind of how to the, the bellwethers are going and what those are and what they mean. Um, and then I'll turn it to Mark Chalos, who is going to discuss his experience specifically with the Purdue bankruptcy that Adam just referenced. So I will turn it over to Paul. Okay. Can you see me? I don't see myself. We're good? Okay. Um, let me make sure I'm working. So very, very interesting. When Professor Campos was, was speaking, um, I had all these flashbacks of math class and I got nervous. Um, and then Professor Birch made me even more nervous, um, <clears throat> pointing out all the bad parts about MDL. And, and there's a lot of really good, there's a lot of efficiencies and there's a lot of reasons why uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and uh, uh, let me just sort of try and put some of the detail of this specific case uh, in the context of the things that the professors were speaking about. So Judge Polster has this MDL. Um, how that happens is there's a panel called the Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation. It's seven sitting federal judges that are appointed by the Chief Judge Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and they give this case to Judge Polster. And I remember thinking at the time, uh, I mean, there were cases all over the place and, and, and the reason for it, as Professor Birch said, it's really efficiency. It's instead of having um, litigation in federal courts throughout the country, let's bring it for pretrial purposes to one judge. Um, and I thought, wow, the panel must really respect and like Judge Polster uh, for sending him one of this magnitude. Now, years later, I realized the panel probably doesn't like Judge Polster um, because this is a really a difficult, uh, he called it the, the most complicated constellation of cases in history. And I think he's probably right. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the notion is that all these pretrial rulings, you know, do you state a legally viable claim in this case for public nuisance, for example, or for RICO? Um, can these defendants along the chain from manufacturers to distributors to you know, retail pharmacies be held liable. Uh, and he makes all these initial rulings. And then uh, if there's not a global settlement, cases get sent back, uh, remanded to where they came from. And, and slight you know, difference from what Professor Birch says, I think she's talking general, she's studied a lot of MDLs where there haven't been remands. I mean. Mark Chalos is going to speak, and I represent, for example, the city and county of San Francisco. It's a remanded case. We're getting ready for trial. There's other trials. There was a trial in West Virginia. There was a trial in uh, California. There's a trial that's going to start again before Judge Polster uh, in Ohio against pharmacies. So um, these cases are not just in a black hole. They are There are trials going on. Um, we call them bellwether trials. Typically, a bellwether trial in a large MDL is an effort to get data points, right? To find out what's the value of these claims. Here, my personal belief is uh, we shouldn't be trying these cases and uh, there should be a global resolution. And, and I'm gonna talk about the global resolution against the distributors in Johnson & Johnson in a second. Um, because the reason I'm, I'm, I'm against these sort of bellwethers and these trials in this situation, uh, unlike many, many others, this is, you know, and, and, and Professor Glover talked about this so eloquently at the, at the outset, this is this ongoing epidemic that's, that's just getting worse and we need to abate the epidemic. We need to put a stop to it. And um, the way to do that is not to you know, try cases. And, you know, there's thousands of cases out there. So again, to quote Judge Polster, he said, we could, we could be like Methuselah and live for 900 years and try, a handful of cases a year for the next 900 years. That's not going to help anybody. Um, so th there's a few different ways of, 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 of resolving things on a global basis. Um, obviously, uh, bankruptcy is one way of, of getting closure for a defendant. As, as uh, Professor Levitin just mentioned, it's really not an ideal way for any of us here. Um, so we tried the idea of a class action. Now, you know, for those of you who are non-lawyers, your, your experience with the class action may be getting a, a notice in the mail from my firm or Mark's firm and throwing it in the trash. 
um, which is typically what happens. But um, a class action is a way of, of, of resolving things on, on a basis for everybody. And uh, as the professor said, you typically in a, in a 23B3 class action, which is your garden variety money damages class action, there's an opportunity to opt out. What we tried to come up with here is what was called a negotiation class. And um, others referenced uh, Francis McGovern, um, who uh, sadly passed away during this, but th this was really his brainchild, along with um, Bill Rubenstein, a professor at Harvard Law, and uh, a professor named Sam Zakharoff from NYU. Um, and the idea was to be a little different than the typical class action. In a typical class action, lawyers negotiate a settlement and then go to the court and say, hey, we'd like you to certify this class for settlement purposes. Um, so essentially you're, you're, you know, you're selling something that you, that's not yours to sell. You, you, you don't have a class yet. The idea here was let's let Judge Polster say the, the subdivisions can negotiate all together as a class and then we can have a negotiation. Um, you know, and different people have different opinions of it. The, the, there were some uh, objections and, and, and uh, uh, ultimately the Sixth Circuit didn't agree with Judge Polster's certification of that. So, so it doesn't exist. We had to come up with a different way of settling claims on a global basis. And uh, we settled the claims with the big three distributors, which is of course McKesson, Amerisource Bergen and, and Cardinal Health. Uh, and then also with Johnson & Johnson, who is a manufacturer. Now they only have a small market share. Their Janssen subdivision manufactured a, uh, a, an opioid called Nucinta. Um, not nearly as, as large in market as one would think because Johnson & Johnson is such a, just a, such a big manufacturer. Um, those settlements are, uh, they're in the midst of being implemented and, and, and it's, it's been somewhat challenging, right? So you've got the states that brought lawsuits that are settling uh, for the state, the AGs, and then you also have the subdivisions. And we're working together and it hasn't always been um, easy and collaborative. Uh, there's been some jostling, um, but I think overall we've gotten to a, a point now where <clears throat> the team that I'm on that's negotiating for the subdivisions is working very, very closely with a team of AGs, um, Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. Um, and we all realize like the common good is to get money um, to, to abate the epidemic, treatment, uh, recovery, education. Uh, remember, these are for the, for the governmental entity. So this is different than um, victims seeking compensation for wrongful death or for, for oh, and those cases exist. Um, we're not trying to overtake those cases. This is about getting money into the budgets and, and um, being able to pay for programs that are gonna be necessary to get rid of this uh, epidemic. And it's gonna take a lot of time. And as experts have said, even if not one more opioid is manufactured um, or distributed, this is still a generational problem. This doesn't just disappear. And a lot of people on this, um, on this Zoom know a, a whole lot more about uh, treatment and recovery than I do. Um, but I do know it's a major, major problem and it's gonna be difficult. Um, so the way the settlement works is states have the opportunity to, to join. Um, once a state decides to join, its subdivisions then have essentially four months to decide if they want to participate. And there are many subdivisions that are represented by council. Again, this goes slightly contrary to what my friend Beth Birch talked about. They, they, they're not forced in. Um, they can decide to go their own way. They can decide to try their own case. Um, I hope they don't because I think it's better for the country if the more participation that we have. Um, but you know, the problem is you've got, or not the problem, but, but the reality you have a state um, for example, let's say Florida. Florida has a lawsuit against the various defendants. Florida is made up of counties. Um, most of those counties have filed lawsuits and within those counties, you have cities. Most of those cities have filed lawsuits. So it's like one of those, you know, Russian Matryoshka dolls, they call it, where, you know, you open up the state and you've got the county, you open up the county and you've got the city, 
But a resident like me of, of Fort Lauderdale, I'm a resident of Fort Lauderdale, I'm a resident of Broward County, and I'm a resident of the state of Florida. Um, so there's some jostling, uh, whose claims are these? And we've been able to, to work cooperatively in the end with the AGs with respect to those defendants. Um, there's also a lawsuit pending against McKinsey, um, which was a consultant to, to Purdue. I'm sure you've all read the things about that. Uh, what's interesting is McKinsey settled with the AGs. So one of the issues that's gonna come up in the McKinsey litigation, which is not part of our MDL, it's a separate MDL before Judge, uh, Judge Breyer in San Francisco, um, who happens to be the San Francisco remand judge for the other case. Um, but one of the issues that's gonna be teed up there is uh, whether the AGs can take these claims and essentially uh, stop the counties and the subdivisions within their state from pursuing the same claim. <clears throat> and I'm not sure how that's gonna play out, but, uh, but for now against the distributors and against Johnson & Johnson, there's a pot of money in, in, in the aggregate, it's $26 billion. Um, and $26 billion is a lot of money, but most of the public health economists will tell you um, it's still not enough money to abate the epidemic, but at least it's a start. Um, and in order to get that money flowing, we have to see what level of participation we get. From the defendant's perspective, they want global peace. Um, and I go back and forth from a plaintiff's perspective, do I care about global peace or do I just want to get as much money as I can from my clients? In this context, unlike some other cases, I think we want global peace because um, if Florida settles, but Georgia doesn't, um, that doesn't really help the epidemic, right? Because people go across the border and on a, on a smaller level, on a county-wide basis, if Broward County settles, but Palm Beach County doesn't, it doesn't really help you. So we really need uh, buy-in here. The more buy-in we get, the more money we get. Um, and that is, we're literally in the midst of that um, process now. Uh, we know that we have at least 42, 43 states that are in. Know this is, in, is going out now to the subdivisions within those states. Um, and so time will tell um, how we've done. And, and uh, you know, we're working, it's not just the lawyers that were appointed in the MDL. There's, um, there's many, many, many lawyers that are not part of the leadership in the MDL that we talk to on a daily basis about their clients, um, about how they get paid. So <clears throat> with all respect to, to Professor Birch, and I think her research has been excellent, and she's done a lot to sort of pull the curtain back on, on these MDLs. This case is a little bit different. And I don't say that only because I'm involved in it, but we're really trying, you know, this is not a, a, a about just sort of insiders in the lead trying to make a bunch of money. This is about trying to abate an epidemic and be inclusive, not exclusive. Um, <clears throat> another alternative, of course, unfortunately, is bankruptcy. And if we continue with litigation um, and trial after trial after trial, even, even the big three distributors, as, as you know, they're, they're some of the biggest co companies in the world, they still could be vulnerable to bankruptcy if, if you didn't find a way to resolve the case. Um, the Purdue bankruptcy that the professor spoke about, Mark Chalos, my colleague, uh, and friend is, is working closely, um, representing one of our joint clients and other clients in, in the bankruptcy proceedings. So he may speak more about that, but um, I think this was an example of litigation really doing some good. You know, and again, to take it full circle, um, Professor Glover quoted Judge Polster as saying, you know, he got stuck with this because the, the other branches of government didn't deal with it. And I think that's true. And I think he's done a, really, really excellent job of dealing with it. Um, litigation has a bad reputation. People don't like litigious people or, or lawyers. I get it. In this case, I think we achieved something. Um, and, you know, these defendants weren't just gonna voluntarily pay $26 billion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, before I turn it to Mark, um, I just wanted to say a couple things. One, um, we're going to have a Q&A um, after Mark speaks. So if you want to send anything in the chat, I'll be sure to facilitate that. 
And then substantively, uh, just building on the last point uh, that Paul made, and um, I, I feel like I'm not telling tales out of school because I've, I've written and published on this, that you know, litigation and lawyers and, and mass litigation, as Paul said, it does get a bad rap. But if you look at the regulatory system in the United States, it is by design and by congressional choice over and over and over and over again, um, the way that we regulate harm in the United States and is often the only method of recourse, um, imperfect or otherwise, that so many have in our system. And it has, um, in that way, opportunities. It, of course, has lots of limitations. Um, but I think sort of joining Paul's point with Sergio's introduction, um, litigation here, and, and, and I also applaud Judge Polster for dealing with one of the hardest uh, cases ever, um, litigation isn't by accident or opportunism, it's by design, and frankly, uh, the only regulatory uh, arm sometimes that public health crises and uh, victims of those crises have. Uh, bankruptcy is slightly different and has become a bigger player in the mass uh, litigation context. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mark, um, and then we will open up the q and I'm going to going to open up with a question about preclusive effect at the end. And then if others have questions in the chat, um, uh, we'll bring everybody in at that point. So Mark, I'll turn it to you. OK, thanks, Professor. Um, one of the uh, advantages of going last in a panel with such intelligent and informed speakers is that um, they've said most of what I had planned to say. But uh, what I'd like to do is maybe zoom out and and look at um, some of the lessons I think that we can learn from this litigation, from the Purdue bankruptcy and from the Mallinckrodt bankruptcy. And there's one other bankruptcy that's currently ongoing as well, a smaller company called Insys, and also the MDL litigation. And, and, and uh, I, I would suggest there are really three areas that uh, we can focus on and um, think about, and I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunity for scholarship, you know, in the future, given how complicated this constellation of, of litigation has been. But um, I think there are three areas that we can learn from the bankruptcies, the litigation, and uh, think about future um, interaction between the litigation system and public health crises. And the first is is the area of injunctive relief and Professor Levitin touched on this as being one of the features of the bankruptcy where, for example, you can direct the money to abatement. Um, but that is also the injunctive relief, I think, is a feature not only of the bankruptcies, but also of the settlements. And this has been, I think, a, a significant focus uh, of Paul Geller's work in this case. Through the J&J &J and Big Three bankruptcy uh, settlements and then the Purdue bankruptcy, uh, the industry has changed. There have been absolutely game-changing um, provisions in both the settlements and the bankruptcy. For example, Johnson & Johnson is out of the opioids business for at least the next decade. Uh, while they were a relatively, relatively small player, and I say that in relation to the market itself, they still had a, a significant presence uh, in the opioids world, and that they're out of that business. Um, the big three distributors, one of their primary defenses through litigation has been that they only saw a small slice of the market. So uh, McKesson would say, yeah, we delivered, you know, 8 million pills into the small community, but we didn't realize there were really 100 million pills going in there because we didn't deliver the other, you know, 92 million or whatever it is. Uh, the settlement requires that they have a clearinghouse for that information. So the distributors will see the full picture of all the opioids that are going into various communities. So maybe it ends up being something like uh, what Professor Campos described, where, you know, if there's a reckoning at the end, um, they will no longer have the defense of saying we didn't know, uh, for example. Um, and that's a, a major game changer. And then both with the Purdue settlement and the, uh, I'm sorry, the Purdue bankruptcy and then the big three J&J &J settlements, the money is earmarked for abatement. And what's so important about that is, you know, these much of the money here is not going to individuals. And I'm, I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. Much of it is going to governmental entities, governmental entities, cities, counties, states. They have their own legislatures, uh, whatever they call them, whether they're city councils or county commissions or or state legislatures that ultimately decide how their money is spent. 
every year they'll do a budget and they decide on the money to spend. If the money were to go in the general fund, what happens in 18 years from now or even one year from now may be very different from what we envision today with the settlement. So that, that this money is earmarked and protected for solely for abatement uses is incredibly significant. And with respect to the settlements, we're talking about over an 18 year period. So uh, these settlements are effectively binding state legislatures and, and county and city legislatures, um, you know, almost two decades into the future. That's extraordinary. And, and that will go a long way towards solving ultimately, uh, or at least ameliorating the opioid epidemic. And that that's, those features could not be accomplished, I don't think in any other way. They could not be accomplished through, you know, sort of run of the mill um, litigation. You know, if we went to trial, got the biggest verdict in the world, got 18 billion trillion dollars for our clients, uh, that would just be money into the general funds. So these settlements and these bankruptcies have accomplished something that we couldn't otherwise. So I think that's something important. That's an interesting and I think noteworthy takeaway as we look at how the litigation process can play a role in future uh, solving, hopefully, pu future public health crises. Um, the second point, and I don't want to get too into the weeds on this, but I think it, it touches on something that Professor Birch raised, which is um, this litigation was different and is different in that uh, the driving force are the driving forces are the state AGs, the the subdivisions, which are the counties and cities, the the Native American tribes. These are highly engaged actors. Uh, they have, in almost all instances, their own lawyers. Long before uh, Paul Geller and I ever showed up, or they ever called us to represent them, they have their own lawyers. They're um, sophisticated, they're, they're policymakers, they're public health, um, you know, by necessity, they're, they're public health experts in their communities at least, and they're engaged in this process. They are not passive by any stretch. And even when you talk about the 30,000 uh, subdivisions around the country, uh, a good number of those, I think I, I've heard 65% or of the population in the U.S. has is represented by lawyers specifically in the um, in the litigation. But in any event, those entities are very much engaged. We get calls. I'm sure Paul gets this. We get calls all the time from lawyers who are not on the uh, leadership, but are nevertheless interested and engaged. So uh, this is a very much a participatory group. Uh, whether they are um, cities, counties, certainly the states are very much engaged. So it's a little bit different, I think, in that respect from the uh, ordinary class member who on Professor Campos's charts has relatively low stakes. It's, it's huge to them in their world. But when you look at it mathematically compared to the uh, exposure of the defendant, it would be considered relatively low. Uh, while the cities and counties may have a similarly mathematically small stake, they are very much engaged, uh, maybe mathematically disproportionately engaged uh, because they have other accountabilities. So uh, something to think about, I think, as we go forward and think about litigation in the context of public health crises. And, and the third sort of broad takeaway here, I think that uh, because this litigation is first of all so important and so impactful in our, in, in our everyday communities, lives. Um, and because it has almost everything in it, it has uh, administrative actions, it has state court actions, it has Native American tribes and the sovereign issue, sovereignty issues that arise there. It's got uh, federal court, it's got MDL, it's got bankruptcy. Um, you've got the federal government with a role here. You intersect with the regulatory bodies in various states and then the federal government. It's got a little bit of everything involved here. Um, I think it really will give us a, a great opportunity to look at uh, where that system can be improved and where those various undertakings can be improved. Um, the MDL process, certainly I don't think anybody would argue that it's perfect. Um, there are certainly opportunities there for improvement. Professor Birch, I think, identified some of them. And, and this idea about remands, just as, as an example, uh, one of the issues we should look at is right now the MDL judge is asked to do an enormous amount of work and to take cases that are, are disparate and, and uh, you know, although they have that commonality element, uh, 
Professor Birch identified, it's not the same commonality that we'd look at under Rule 23. Um, they have lots of different interests, lots of different pressures. They have their regular docket that they have to tend to. Um, and we ask them to resolve the MDL, but then we don't give them a very important tool, which is the ability to try cases to give all the parties a sense of the value of the cases monetarily, but also, uh, you know, we all tend to believe, believe our own baloney, so to speak. You know, we all think that our claims are the greatest. We think that the defenses are bogus. The defendants think that the lawsuits are bogus and their defenses are meritorious. Uh, trials are a great way to uh, ferret that out and ultimately to give the tools to both sides and to a neutral to settle a case. We don't give that by and large to the MDL judge. Uh, we say that you can try a very, very, very small sliver of cases, those that venue would otherwise be appropriate in your court, uh, or a case that the defendants agree to try there. Um, and, and given the state of the, and I don't wanna to get too into the weeds on this, but given the state of the uh, personal jurisdiction jurisprudence and the venue jurisprudence, um, we have a very limited ability for MDL judges to try cases. So that's an area we should look at is, is expanding the court's ability to use that incredibly important settlement tool. If we're gonna ask MDL judges to settle the cases, uh, that would, I think, alleviate this concern that remands equal failure. Uh, I don't think they do, but uh, to the extent that some think that. And I think there's also a great opportunity here to look at the bankruptcy system as well. Uh, we're, we're gonna look at, <laughs> whether non-debtor releases are a real thing, uh, whether we like it or not, we're looking at that. And at some point we'll get guidance from uh, uh, presumably an appellate court on that. Uh, but it also gives us an opportunity to look at whether the bankruptcy system is serving tort claimants appropriately. Uh, and you talked about scheduling claims. And, and if you look at uh, Professor Levitin, and if you look at the priority of claims, I mean, the light bills get paid, the bankruptcy lawyers get paid, the executives get paid, the executives who made the decisions that you know, directly or indirectly put them into the bankruptcy and, and maybe caused a lot of harm in the world. Uh, and then somewhere after all of those people have sort of picked at, at the bank accounts, you get the tort claimants. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to look at that as well and see whether we're, our values are being served by um, and I forgot the great way you described it, Professor, but the, uh, the catch-all, the, the sink, whatever it was, the, the drain uh, of the uh, American economy. So uh, I think we're going to have a lot of opportunities here to really zoom out after uh, Paul and I and others you know, do kind of the, the messy work of, of sorting this all out and, and advocating for our clients and working with the various interests and the various forces that ultimately we'll get this resolved. I think there's gonna be a great opportunity for all of us to catch our breath and think about what we've learned here and how we can use this positively to address future public health crises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, for anyone who wants to ask a question, there's a Q and A uh, function at the bottom while uh, folks are getting acquainted with that. Um, I just wanted to start off with kind of a functional question that might go to the various stakeholders who are affected by the opioid epidemic. We have state governments, we have local governments, we have municipalities, we have you know, various communities with different needs, and we also have individuals who uh, either suffered from opioid substance use disorder or their families. And my question, and, and this is for Paul and Mark, but, but really for anybody, um, and just to, to lay the groundwork for folks who, who don't speak some of, some of these terms, the preclusive effect, and, and just to clarify what that is. So when lawsuits are uh, resolved or settled, when bankruptcies are resolved, um, often um, the effect of those settlements is to preclude, or in other words, prohibit, um, others from bringing suit on the same claims. And there are various limitations and doctrinal uh, machinations to that within the judicial world. But just broadly, Paul and others, as these settlements start happening and, and Mark and, and Adam, as these bankruptcies continue to happen, what sort of preclusive effect might those settlements, or, or if we know already what's in the settlements, have on individual claims, um, 
you know, the individual claimants, not the municipalities, um, but, but the individual claims. So <clears throat> this is Paul. The, <clears throat> there's a lot to talk about with preclusive effects in these settlements, but they won't have a preclusive effect on the individual claims. So <clears throat> th there's arguments about whether um, a state settlement might preclude claims of its, of its municipalities or whether a county's settlement might preclude claims of its um, uh, uh, the municipalities within, within the county. But as far as individual claims, those who have been harmed, I mean, we all unfortunately know people who have been, or ourselves have been directly impacted by this crisis. Um, so those individual claims against these defendants will not be precluded by the fact that the county or the um, state in which you live uh, brought claims on behalf of the government. Um, the, what's interesting is in the settlement, and I don't wanna to go too far off of your question, and I, I wanna see if, if, if Adam or Mark have more to say on the bankruptcies, but the way this settlement is structured, I mentioned this before, the, the 26 billion, and that's really the two settlements, it's the distributors and Johnson Johnson, that's the maximum amount that they'll pay. And they only pay that amount if a very, very high percentage of subdivisions um, states and subdivisions are included. Um, but as fewer subdivisions participate, the amount goes down. So as a result, let's say I, I as a lawyer represent, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, but 20 subdivisions and uh, um, 16 of them are in, but four decide not to participate. And they have the right not to participate. These are governmental entities, they, they, they have, oftentimes their own general counsel and they, they make decisions. Um, so my the 16 that are in are getting a little bit less than they would get because I've got four that are out. And to take it a step further, <clears throat> there's provisions about future litigation. So um, again, the defendants want to pay, uh, only want to pay the maximum if they're going to sort of end this, you know, ongoing litigation. Um, so we actually have an ethics opinion as part of the settlement for lawyers that suggests that if you represent clients that participate in the settlements and then represent future litigants that are not currently suing, not talking about your current clients that decide not to participate, but new clients in the future, that is an ethics issue because you're your then current, your future representation, which will become a current representation, will impact the recovery of your client in the settlement. So um, that's not sort of um, the type of preclusive effect I think that Professor Glover was, was talking about, but it does cause a preclusive effect of, on, on representing future entities against these settling defendants. It's very interesting. Um, so we have an, another question in the chat from Lonnie Grenier. Um, it was a great question. I'm just going to read it word for word because it's it's expressed so eloquently. Despite the intense need for residential treatment, nonprofit provider agencies often have difficulty accessing funding opportunities for bricks and mortar. Um, this is just editorializing. This is something I see, you know, back where I'm from in, in East Tennessee. How might these providers on the ground floor most effectively advocate and, and integrate um, into this funding to strengthen and expand the behavioral health infrastructure on the ground? And, and that's just sort of open to everyone, but I would imagine Paul and Mark have particular insight on that. Yeah, um, I, I can address that initially, Paul, if that's okay. Um, so I think in most states, and this is reflected, I think, accurately in the model um, legislation that uh, LAPA's uh, created. But uh, in most states, there'll be some entity that administers the funds that come from these settlements and come from the bankruptcies. Uh, it'll be called something, uh, you know, Opioid Abatement Council or, or you know, I, I think in the legislation it's called the Opioid Settlement Proceeds Fund or something like that, but um, there'll be some kind of entity 
Uh, and this is a function of what Professor Levitin identified, which is that the money is earmarked for abatement. So it's not going to the general fund. It's not going to fill potholes. It's not going to do any other um, governmental purpose other than abatement. And abatement is defined both in the bankruptcy plan and in the settlements. Uh, so that money will be put into some sort of trust, whatever it's called. It's some sort of entity that's outside of the state's general fund or the county's general funds. And um, there'll be a, an overseeing body, some kind of council. That council will have, depending on the state, uh, it'll have representatives of various constituencies, whether it be boards of health, um, law enforcement, uh, other governmental entities, uh, community organizations. That's where the rubber will meet the road, I think, going forward for the abatement funds. They will have discretion in how to spend the funds. So something like a bricks and mortar treatment center will probably be something that is considered a sort of a regional spend, meaning it won't be necessarily just spent for a particular city or, or county. Uh, it may be depending on the sizes, but that's something that that entity will um, be able to authorize. And there's absolutely no prohibition in any of the definitions of abatement against using it for bricks and mortar. It's not just you know earmarked for programmatic uh, type expenses. So. Uh, those state and those will be at the state level generally. So the state opioid abatement council, whatever it's called, will be the entity that you should approach and educate and lobby for that type of spending. And Mark, is, is, are those the entities who decide precisely what abatement means? That was a question in the in the chat. No. Um, well, uh, yes, I guess literally they decide precisely what abatement means, but they are given categories of permissible abatement spending. Um, so there will be like in the Purdue bankruptcy, there's a list of, of types of, of spending. Um, enforcement, I think, will be interesting how that gets done. Uh, ultimately, um, there are there's a mechanism for enforcement in the Purdue bankruptcy. There's a mechanism for enforcement in the, the various settlement, the J&J &J and distributor settlements. Um, what that ultimately looks like and whether it's effective, I guess we'll see. It's, it's designed to be effective and intended to be effective. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, one area that I don't know how it'll play out, we'll have to see is that while this money is earmarked uh, for abatement, you know, money is fungible. So whether state legislatures ultimately decide that, well, this county over here is getting plenty of money from our opioid abatement fund, we're going to reduce other grants, for example, or other spending in that county. That's a political issue. That's something that will, um, I think, vary by state, vary by locality. I don't know there's anything, I don't think there's anything we can do in the bankruptcy plan or in the settlements to address that issue. It's politics, I think. So just to build on that, and I think you were, Mark, you were responding somewhat to Josh Rising's question in the chat about what's the enforcement, what are the teeth to make sure that these monies go toward abatement and not toward, you know, potholes and rolls and uh, uh, roads and things like that. And you referenced that there are enforcement mechanisms. Are you able to provide any more detail about what those look like? Are, are they new? Are they things we've used in the past that we can draw experience from? We're, you know, we're gonna hear from Professor Brandt later about our experience uh, with tobacco and, and how that didn't work. And I think that's one of the bogeymen that people are worried about. So can you say anything more specifically about the sorts of enforcement teeth mechanisms and how they relate or don't to things we've used in the past? Sure. Um, so. Uh, we can use Tennessee as an example. So th there's a, an opioid abatement council in Tennessee where the all of the money from the Purdue bankruptcy and the Mallinckrodt bankruptcy will reside ultimately. And 70% um, of the money from the J&J &J and big three distributors money will go. That council will be made up of you know, three appointees by the governor, three by the uh, lieutenant governor, three by the speaker of the house. And, you know, the, so there's political accountability there. Um, ultimately, they are accountable uh, to the state legislature in the first instance. And well, let me I should zo zoom in a little bit. The council itself will ensure that the money it spends in the community is spent properly. That's one of their functions. So if they give money to uh, Blunt County, for example, and they say this is for a treatment center, they will have a mechanism to make sure they're using it for the treatment center, not using it for any other reason. 
the state legislature will oversee the council to make sure that the council is distributing the money. We have put in the legislation a requirement that the money gets distributed every year by a certain date. So there's accountability to the state legislature on that. And then at the national level, there are trusts that will be making these grants that will have an enforcement mechanism where they will audit the state abatement council to ensure that it is spending its money um, in one of the categories, A, that it's spending its money, and B, that it's spending its money in those categories of approved abatement. So in the Purdue bankruptcy, there are you know four or five levels of enforcement available, and I expect there'll be something similar in the um, in the Big Three settlement and the J and J settlement. And then one last question, um, and and again to, to the panel, and then we're going to take a quick break before our next panel. Um, and I've gotten some of these in the chat, and some of these by email. Um, in terms of putting together these teams, Mark, that work at the state and local level, um, is there an opportunity? And if so, what is that opportunity um, for sort of for folks working on the ground, for advocates, for people in public policy to influence the way that this enforcement works? Um, because one thing that, that seems troubling to some, some is that if these um, you know panels are run straight out of uh, the the political branches that they're not there's a disconnect between those branches and you know the, the folks really on the ground working towards uh, knowing where these monies ought to go and and things like that so it, it, are there opportunities for sort of integrated and dynamic work in that way I think so uh, one of the concerns is we so we crafted a structure in Tennessee we are working on crafting a structure in Georgia that's somewhat similar one of the concerns that we've um, started with is we do not want to create a separate branch of government now with its own you know lobbying you know uh, entities and and you know its own sort of subsystem within government um, we want it to function more like a health department than a you know state legislature um i we'll see if we were able to create that but one of the ways is by ensuring that the decision makers there are sort of not limited to political actors so there are people from the recovery community people from the public health community um people from local communities that will have a much better i think understanding of what their communities need what works in Blunt County is not going to work in Shelby County, probably, uh, for example, in Tennessee. You know, that's a small rural county versus a larger urban county there. The nature of the problem may be a little bit different, but certainly their needs and their ways to solving it are going to be very different, I think, in, in a lot of respects. So um, the idea is not to populate it with politicians, to put a, a very fine point on it, uh, to avoid some ecosystem of lobbying and, and horse trading from emerging there. I guess, you know, we'll do this conference in 18 years and see if it worked. Um, and I, I promise no more questions, but there, there is one that I'm going to add. And, and just I'm from Blount County. So that so there we go. Um, and this goes to the teeth question. And then we, we will in this panel here and I'll tee up the next panel. Josh Rising asked specifically. So if the legislature passed legislation, the state legislature that took money from the fund, and obviously, you know, there's a lot baked in here about who has authority and, and, and what's executable in the settlement and all those things. But fundamentally, if the legislature passed legislation that took money from the fund, who would, if anyone, have standing to stop that? Well, the defendants in the first order, uh, in the sense, in, in the settlements, I think, there's an enforcement committee that's created, but these settlements are, the settlements are funded over time, over 18 years at, at, the, at the extreme. The Purdue bankruptcy is funded over time. There, there will be payments made, and Paul, tell me if I've gotten this wrong, but there will be payments made on a yearly basis, more or less. And if a state is, falls out of compliance by, for example, passing a law that takes away you know, authority from the Opioid Abatement Council, then they just won't get the payments anymore. And the defendants have a right not to pay. Uh, and there's something similar that the bankruptcies, there's a trust created where the money will flow into. And some of like the Purdue bankruptcy, some of that money is not yet there. It'll be earned there over time in that the Purdue company is going to be a public benefit corporation that is continuing to operate for the purpose of, or one purpose of funding the settlement going forward. So. The money, the spigot of money gets turned off is the short answer.
Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I mean, this, this, we could talk, you know, obviously all day with this panel and thank you so much to everyone on this panel and for all the, all the great questions. Um, after about a five minute break, so just after 11, we're going to turn to the second panel, how settlement funds could accelerate addressing the overdose crisis and spur innovation. We have a fantastic panel moderated by Chan Kemper, who's a senior legislative attorney at LAPA, and our panelists are Dr. Miriam Delton Rittman, the director of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Robert Kent, general counsel for the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and Brandon George, who's the director of Indiana Addiction Issues Coalition and Vice President of Recovery Programs and Advocacy for the Mental Health uh, of America of Indiana. Let's take a five minute break. We'll start about two minutes after 11. Um, great conference so far and see everyone in just a few minutes. 